I have four, 10 years from now, you could be here. And the difference in 10 years between here and here could be significant in money and lifestyle, treasures, equity. In 10 years, an incredible difference. But right here, a small difference in the change of discipline, the change of thinking to start you on this journey versus this journey. Now, it's also very important intellectually to know whether or not you're headed this way or this way. And once you decide, 10 years from now, I think that the gathering of my intellectual and personal and spiritual and moral and economic treasure may not be that great. The key is to start right now making these changes to walk this new road. But here's what's exciting to me. Just a few daily disciplines makes a great deal of difference in one year, three years, five years, just a few daily disciplines, whether you wind up here or here. Good question. 10 years from now, you will surely arrive. The question is, where? We don't want to kid ourselves about where. We don't want to kid ourselves about the road we're walking. I had a day shortly after I met Mr. Schof called, do not kid myself anymore day. I don't want to go disillusioned anymore. You know, I was using the cross finger theory back when I was 25, 24, 23. I finally decided that the cross finger theory was not going to get me what I wanted. That isn't where the treasure lies. That I'm going to have to make sure which of these ways I'm headed. But a few reading disciplines and a few disciplines of mind and a few disciplines of activity. And you can make all the difference in the world whether you wind up here or whether you wind up here. But just a few changes. Sometimes we get the idea that we're doing about 10% and there's about 90% more that we need in order to make the difference for our fortune. And probably the opposite is true. We're doing enough things to have bought and shared in the good life so far. And maybe all you need is that extra 5%, 10% of intellectual change, activity change, a refinement of discipline, a refinement of thought. And all we need is the ideas to make those simple changes. And the equity starts gathering in one year, three years, five years, 10. So here's one of the key questions of the evening. Starting tomorrow, what are you going to do? that'll make a change in your life's direction. Good question. What are you gonna do starting tomorrow that'll make a difference? Now see, if you don't do something starting tomorrow that'll make a difference, guess what? It's gonna be the same. <laughs> and see, that way you can guess what the next five years are gonna be like. Look at the last five. Because the next five are going to be like the last five, unless you, major key, tomorrow, change it all. Or change a little, or change something, or don't change. It's choice time. You can do whatever you want. But it's nice to know any day you wish you can change your whole life. What can you do starting tomorrow that'll make a difference? Good question. What can you do with economic chaos, massive disappointment. What can you do with a broken heart? What can you do and it won't work? Good question. If you want your life to change, here's the source of it all. Ideas plus inspiration. Now, ideas are not that far away. Everything you need is within reach. The ideas you need for life change or business change is within reading reach. It's within listening reach. There's probably a library not too far from you. The problem is, right, there's a library there, but most people drive by. Very few drive in. Do you know how many people own a library card in the United States? 3%. And guess how much they cost? Nothing. Wow. But see, it's within reach. Now, the key is, who's going to reach? There's a simple Bible phrase, and I'm an amateur on the Bible, but here's what it says. If you search, you will find. But it's very important to know that finding is reserved for the searchers. We don't find what we need, we find what we search for. Needing is not the prerequisite to getting value. You can't be a needer, you have to be a searcher. But if you'll search, if you'll try, if you'll go, if you'll listen, ideas are within reach. And ideas are life-changing. There's nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. A business idea, a social idea, an investment idea, good health idea. All you need is just the refinement of an idea to make an impact on your life. 
gather treasure, gather equity, gather wealth. Because it doesn't take much to make a significant difference as the time passes. A good note for you to take. We could all use a little coaching. Listen to someone's experiences and see if it might cause for you a little moment of correction so that you can make some changes that'll add up to some extra worth in the next one year, three years, five years. All kinds of ideas, health ideas, enterprise ideas, living the better life ideas. Now, if you're excited and you're ready to change, find out how things work. The first key to doing better is find out. To change your life, really, you need ideas. There isn't anything an idea can't change. And Schultz taught me the major problem is lack of an idea, not a problem. At first, I didn't have any money. I said to Mr. Schultz, I don't have any money. He said, that's not a problem. Now, see, up until then, I always thought it was. <laughs> right? I was confused. He said, no, no, the problem is lack of an idea on how to create money and wealth. It isn't lack of money, it's lack of ideas. So if you get the ideas, see, so you can change anything. Now, to get ideas, you need a constant study of finding out. Now, Schoff also said, when you find out something that works, put the information in your journal. Don't use your head for a filing cabinet. Put it in your journal so that you can do the next best thing. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Go over it. And if you repeat it, go over it, sure enough, someday, some mysterious day, the idea takes root, starts to grow, and shows up in your bank account, and your dress, and your personality, and your lifestyle. But capture the ideas in your journal. Find out how things work. Shok gave me this word for my life change. He said, study. Great word. If you wish to be successful, study success. If you wish to be happy, study happiness. If you wish to be wealthy, study wealth. Don't leave it to chance. Make it a study. Some people just go through the day with their fingers crossed. See, that won't do it. You've got to study the things that can change your economic, social, spiritual, personal life. Become a good reader. All of the successful people I know and work with around the world, they're all good readers. Curiosity drives them to read. They got to know. Become a good reader. Now, that's my opinion. Listen to the other lecturers and listen to me and make up your own mind. Don't be a follower. Be a student. Okay? I say, really, for life change, you got to read. One way to learn is from your own experiences. But another way to learn is from other people's experiences. See, one book might save you five years if you read it. Did you know there's books on how to be stronger, more decisive? Be a speaker, be a leader, have a better effect on other people, develop your personality. Did you know there's books on that and people don't read them? How would you explain that? And they can read. Did you know that hundreds of successful people have written their stories in books and they wrote down how they did it and people don't read it? How would you explain that? The guy's busy, I guess. You know, you get tied up. The guy says, well, yeah, you work where I work, but the time you struggle home, it's late. You got to eat a bite of supper, watch a little TV, get to bed. You can't sit up half the night reading, 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 reading. And the guy's behind on his car payment. Good worker, hard worker, sincere. But you got to be better than sincere and work hard. Otherwise, at the end of your life, you'll wind up cold, stony broke. You got to be better than a good worker. You got to be a good reader. You may not be able to do all you find out, but you should find out all you can do. See, you don't want to wind up at the end of your life and discover that you've lived only one-tenth of it. And the other nine-tenths went down the drain not for lack of opportunity, for lack of information. 
Now, here's the best human virtue for finding out, curiosity. Make a note of that, curiosity, be curious. You might add a word to it that'll help, childish curiosity. What will kids do if they wanna know something bad enough? Bug you, that's the phrase. They can ask a thousand questions. You think they're through, they got another thousand. They'll drive you to the brink. It's a virtue. When you gotta know, be like a child. In fact, Jesus, the master teacher said, unless you can become like little children, you might as well forget it. You don't have a prayer. Excellent advice. You gotta be like children. Four ways, in my opinion, to be like a child. Number one's curiosity. Number two is excitement. Get excited like a child over your ability to make yourself do anything for change. Third is faith. Have faith like a child. Adults are too skeptical. And fourth is trust. Trust is a childish virtue, but the rewards are incredible. So be like a child. Now there's millions of books, so you can't read all the books. But here's what I mean by read all the books. Read all the books you need to read to make your fortune become powerful, influential, healthy, prosperous, aware, bright, helpful, partnership, father, mother, grandparent. Read all the books you need for your life to flourish and become the best it can possibly be during the course of your lifetime. Read all of those books. Don't be short on that list. One of the greatest experiences any of us can have is the experience of influence. To persuade somebody that we've got a good idea, to persuade somebody to buy a product or consider a service, to be able to influence somebody to a way of life, a product, a, an idea, a company, a corporation, an enterprise. Influence is one of the greatest of life's experiences. The chance to influence somebody else, their thinking, their future, maybe their lives, is a great experience. And all the way from being a manager to an executive to being a parent, we all have in some respects the chance and the opportunity to influence somebody else. Now, the key is to develop the skills to do it. There's one thing in doing it casually, another thing in doing it hazardly, and the other is to do it on purpose by learning the skills. Gathering the skills to help influence people to a way of thinking, to a product, to an idea, to an enterprise, or just to a better life. I think, first of all, to get more, we need to just be thankful for what we already have. But let's be thankful for where we are because that's how good ideas start to flow. Thanksgiving for what you've already got. Here's what blocks the flow of all good information, cynicism. It's not that difficult to be a practiced cynic. Feeling cynical about circumstances, cynical about place, cynical about opportunities, cynical about people. But if we turn that around, turn cynicism into Thanksgiving, now the ideas can flow, information can flow, refinement of ideas can flow. So that's number one, be thankful. Here's number two, be eager to learn. No matter what you know, there's always some more. There's nothing like a good, powerful discussion to refine an idea. What we want is ideas that pass the test of the tough questions. And it's good to be around people who can ask the tough questions. Debate has a unique way of refining ideas that can become of value. But here's what I ask you to do, argue with all this stuff later. Go back over your notes and relive the experience and think about what we've shared with you here. The key is to stimulate the mind, to think thoughts and to think ideas, to open up channels of information. Refinement of intellect is where the future fortune lies. But be eager to learn. And the last comment is, be a good listener, which isn't easy these days. Everybody wants our attention. Radio voices and television voices and advertising voices and political voices and social voices and religious voices and community voices and family voices. And how do you sort through all the voices and give extra time to a voice of substance? It isn't easy. But if you'll practice the art of good listening, no telling what you can find in the way of ideas that can help change your life. 
The next key word is inspiration. Inspiration is a mystery why some people are inspired and some are not. Who knows what that mystery is? Emotional vitality. Some people have this incredible zest for life and an appetite for living well and doing well, and others seem to take the ho-hum attitude, let it slide, and hopefully it'll work out anyway. I don't know what the difference of that is. But it is exciting to watch people who are inspired. But I think the key to it all is self-motivation. Personal inspiration, drawing emotional vitality from life and the challenge, going for it. We all admire that. Now, just a personal word. I don't know where I've caught you in this particular lecture series. Maybe this is springtime for you. You've got a new opportunity going and no telling what you're going to make of it. And you're all excited. Maybe some of you, we've caught you in harvest time. Maybe you're celebrating. Maybe this is the summertime for you when sometimes the going is tough and the weeds are attacking your garden and the bugs are after your values. Summertime is an interesting time. It's not that easy to last from spring till fall. Summer's a test, and especially when the creditors are calling. So I don't know, maybe we've caught you in a testing time. Maybe this is challenging time for you, the summertime. Maybe I've caught you in winter, and I'm sure we've all had some of those winter times, sort of desperate times, decision-making times. Maybe I've caught you in this series at the fork of the road, and some of the decisions you make in the immediate future are going to have everything to do with your next five years, ten years. And I've been to a few of those called forks in the road. I mean, which way do you go? What do you select now as your next path of opportunity? And maybe these are trying times for you. Winter can be a source of trial when the push is on and the press is on. You got to get going. You got to take action. The disciplines is the miracle process. And here's how to get the miracle of your future going as far as disciplines are concerned. Number one, do what you can. You might go home and set a whole... This month. Get ready for next year, this year. Always be a day ahead and a step ahead and a year ahead in your research and your development, in researching your own feelings and life and what's going on so that no matter what conversation comes up, what chance to communicate comes up, whether it's a business communication or a personal communication, whether it's social, whatever it is, you'll be more ready for it a few months from now than perhaps you are now, just because you're doing it deliberately and consciously. So that's number one, have something good to say. First step to good communication. Here's the second step, say it well. Part of communication is saying it well. And there are some key points on saying it well, having a good conversation that gets your point across, but also gets the job done. Saying it well is a matter of repetition, conscious repetition. Some people say it over and over and over, but they don't get any better at it. But conscious participation, repetition, will help you to say it better. See, my first seminars, they, they were not that good. I'll admit that. But guess what? I did it again with the thought in mind of getting better. I did it again with the thought in mind of getting better. Okay? I practiced it some more. I did it some more. I went over it again. I went over it again. And sure enough, if you do it over and over and over and over consciously with the thought of getting better, guess what? Anybody can get better. People, people often wonder why I can do the evening seminar, three and a half hours, most of you have been there, and I don't use any notes. Interesting. Once in a while someone asks me, how can you do three and a half hours and you don't use any notes? And it's very simple. Anybody could do it. Guess why I'm able to do it? I've done it a few thousand times. See, if you do something a few thousand times consciously, sure enough, you will get better and better and better. So whatever you're doing now in the way of communication, the question to ask is, how long do you want it to take to get good at it? You say, well, I want to get good right away. Then you got to do it over and over and over and over. Repetition helps you to get better. So the second step to good communication is saying it well. Now, there's some other points on saying it well. 
Here they are. One, say it with sincerity. And I don't know any substitute for sincerity. Almost everybody wants the feeling from someone else that you are being sincere, that you're not playing games with me, that you're really disclosing to me your true feelings, your true awareness, what's going on in your life, in your heart, in your soul, in your mind. Sincerity, there's no substitute for that. Once in a while, someone asks me, when the seminar is finished, they say, look, Mr. Owen, everybody's gone now, just but tell me the truth now. <laughs> that story you tell about meeting Mr. Shelf when you were 25 years old, and uh, he hired you, you went to work for him, spent five years with him, he taught you the principles, how to turn your life around. He said, now that's just a story, right? That didn't really happen. Isn't that just a story to make all this sound good? Isn't that interesting that somebody would ask me if that was just a story or not, or if it really happened? To be sincere, it's got to be true. You just can't come up with sincerity telling an erroneous story. Now, you might make it sound sincere, but sure enough, Someday it'll come back to haunt you. Saying it well is saying it sincerely. Saying it well is saying it accurately. You don't want a lack of credibility to creep into your communication. So you just got to be sincere. Tell the truth. The truth is so powerful, you don't need to dress it up with fiction. Another part of saying it well is saying it with brevity. Don't linger too long on any one point, because I got a good disclosure for you. The human attention span is short. You can't linger too long on any one thing. You've got to move along. So brevity, brevity. I used to tell long, 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 long stories, and I stretched them out so long people forgot the beginning by the time I got to the end. <laughs> and now the end doesn't make much sense, right? Because you can't hook them both up. I just drug them out too long, too long. People get weary. You just got to practice being brief, being brief, being brief. Short, short. Attention span is short. The best practice on this is to practice with kids because their attention span is really short, <laughs> right? And they don't mind telling you, right? You start talking to the kids, right? And kids say, how long is this going to take, right? I mean... <laughs> Right away, they get the feeling you're going to take 30 seconds. And you should only take 10, right? I mean, they get bored right away. So short, short. Make, make your stories short. Be brief in your illustrations. If you're going to say, let me, here's something that happened to me one time. Don't give people a feeling now that you're about to launch into a 20-minute story. Just make sure you get the feeling across that you're going to be brief. It isn't going to take long. You're going to get the story across. And I guess part of that is our high-powered, speeded-up way of living, uh, especially in this country. But it is true. If you want to be effective in communication, you've got to be brief. On any one point, you can't linger long. And I think I've lingered long enough on that <laughs> point. Next, saying it well is saying it with style. Now, part of style is your personal style. And this involves a whole lot of things. It can involve gestures. It can involve facial expressions. Uh, you talk with your eyes. You know, you speak with your facial expressions as well as with your words. Uh, some people talk more with their hands. That's part of your style. Uh, gestures, all of that. Now, here's the key on this, is to develop your own style. However, be a student of style. First, have something good to say. Second is to say it well, consciously say it well. Practice saying it well. Get to where the words come more clearly, more freely. 
things you used to stumble over when you talked a year ago. You just correct that. You just correct it and correct it so that now it flows better. Shorten the stories used to be long. Now they're shorter. You just do all that consciously, consciously, so that you get better and better at it, saying it well. Okay, here's the third step to good communication. And this is so important. Read the effect you're having. When you communicate, see, that's just major. Study your audience, whoever your audience may be. If it's one of your children, you just study what's happening to them while you're talking. Right? Look in their eyes, look in their face. Analyze what's going on between you and whoever you're talking to, another person. Whether it's a business conversation or a social conversation, you've got to be keenly aware of what's happening to whoever you're communicating with. Now, a real challenge is communicating uh, with an audience. We had about 1,200 people the other night in Orange County, right? And I've got to make sure that everybody from down here, down in front, way in the back, how to gather up a thousand people's attention, right? For the three and a half hour period. Now that's a real challenge. I didn't used to be that good at it. In fact, when I first started lecturing, I was hardly aware of my audience. I was so absorbed in my notes and my material, I guess what? They could have all got up and left and I would have never known it. <laughs> I wouldn't have missed them. I'd have just kept right on talking, right? Because I was so absorbed in the material, I was so absorbed in trying to say it right and do it right, that I was not aware of what was going on with my audience. But you've got to read the effect you're having for really effective communication. Now, if it's just an informal communication situation, you can just ask the question, do you read me? Right? Does it make sense? Did I say it well? And you'll get this feedback right, so you can actually Start checking how you're doing with somebody if it's informal. You can just ask, okay? Now, what you've also got to learn to do is read the, some of the subtle things that are going on with whoever you're talking to. Because especially humans, or especially adults, you know, when we get a little older, we have these tricky ways of, of looking like we're interested when we're really not. And if you want to be a good communicator, you just got to pick up some of those signals. Now, part of it you can pick up by what we call body language. Some people just sort of quickly disclose their feelings about whether or not you're effective or it's coming across, and they just sort of relay to you by their, what we call body language. It's kind of a new study. I haven't studied that much about it, but there is a book called How to Read a Person Like a Book. How to Read a Person Like a Book by Nuremberg. You just might make a little study on that. Now, don't get too involved in it because sometimes you can so watch somebody in the way they blink their eyes and, you know, you're looking at their ears and looking at their hair and you just, now you get too carried away and trying to figure out, you know, all about them. But you can get some indication. But here's what will here's what'll play you good no matter what. It's called just pure common sense. You just look at somebody. You can kind of tell. If somebody just folds their arms and they tuck their head down like this, sure enough, you've probably got some more selling to do. I mean, you've got to pour it on. Or maybe you should change the subject. Or maybe you should quit. <laughs> right? You just, <laughs> just kind of analyze, you know, what's going on here. Right? You, some things are just fairly obvious. You know, a guy's leaning toward the door like this. It's probably a sign, right? And you say, oh, I got it, right? It's clear. I've got a good word for the common sense approach, and it goes like this. Let the obvious be your best teacher. Whatever you do, don't ignore the obvious. You know, sometimes we say, oh, it couldn't be. Yes, it probably is. <laughs> But adults especially, sometimes this is a bit tricky. People smile, nod their head like this, and they got you shut off, and you just don't know. Okay. Because in good communication, you cannot mistake 
courtesy for interest. Sometimes people would be courteous, but that doesn't mean they're interested. Now, if you mistake their courtesy for their interest now, see, you've lost the, the hold on good communication. Also, you can also develop um, a sense of picking up signals. I think the women probably have it over on the men when it comes to this sort of sixth sense of being able to tell, no matter what it, the situation looks like, women have this uncanny gift. I guess men can develop it, but the women already have it. You know, the antenna is out. I mean, they pick up signals nobody else can pick up. I mean, the men don't have a chance. I think part of it is because until the industrialized society came, uh, women were primarily the protectors. The man was the provider, right? He was gone. He was out there getting the game or whatever. And the woman was the protector. So I think the woman has devised these incredible uh, sensitivities to danger and what's going on, what's happening. I, they're uncanny. Even the Bible says there's sheep and there's the shepherd and then there's the wolves. That's what it says. Life is kind of like that, shepherd and sheep and wolves. It says also some wolves are so clever They've learned to dress up like sheep <laughs> and talk like sheep, I guess. That's what it says. Some are wolves in what? Sheep's clothes. Sheep's clothes. Now, see, you got to be clever. Huh. The man says, well, looks like a sheep, talks like a sheep. Woman says, ain't no sheep. I mean, <laughs> take my word for it. <laughs> but that's that long developed instinct, I guess, right? In the middle of the night, she says, wake up, wake up. Something isn't right out there. He says, uh huh, uh -huh right. I mean, he's gone, right? She says, no, 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 something, something, right? She just, she has this uncanny sense. So that's part of, you know, being able to read is uh, picking up, Mr. Shove called it signals. He says, we all throw off signals, vibrations. Uh, you know, I don't understand all I know about that. But. Have you heard the expression, a dog can tell whether or not you're afraid of him? I guess that's true. We throw off a certain kind of signal and they just, animals, right? They just pick it up, they pick it up, they know. And you can't fake them out, right? You can say, I'm not afraid of you. Dog says, who are you kidding, right? I mean, come on. Okay, being able to read. That's so important, reading your audience. How you're doing. Should you speed up? Should you slow down? Should you change the subject? Should you be a little stronger? Just be more aware of whoever you're talking to. Right? Look a little more intently at somebody. Try to pick up what's happening between you and the audience or the person or the child or the business partner. You can't believe how it will affect your ability to communicate if you'll practice this part of picking up what's happening between you and someone else. Now here's number four. Then we're going to take our first break. The fourth step to good communication is intensity. Strong feelings. Here's what changes the whole effectiveness of good communication. Strong feelings. In affecting other people with words, here's a key breakdown to keep in mind. And it goes like this. To affect other people with words, it's 20% what you know, and it's 80% how you feel. Feelings and emotions changes the whole outcome of communication. Intensity, words loaded with emotion, 
have the best effect. Words might be like a little straight pin, right? When a guy buys a shirt, right? It's got all these little pins in it, right? They were the pin all together. So you start pulling out all these straight pins. What if I took one of those straight pins and uh, I threw it at you, this little straight pin, and it reached you, hit you in the face or hit you in the arm, hand somewhere, right? You'd feel it if I threw that little straight pin at you. What if I took that straight pin and wired it to the end of an iron bar about that long, right? And I let you have it with that. See, I could drive that pin right through your heart, right? Now, the pin is the words, and the iron bar is the emotions, the feelings, the awareness, the uniqueness of all of that mysterious stuff that humans are made of. If you will learn to put more of you into what you say, put more feelings, more awareness, more uniqueness, strength of character, conviction, strong feelings, whatever that is, just be more aware of putting more of you into whatever you say. That's that iron bar that drives what you say to the heart, to the mind, and gets the job done. Words loaded with emotion. Now, you must also learn to measure your emotions. Okay? You don't want a major outburst for a minor point. Learn to measure it. Okay? Some conversations or some points may need, right, just a mild blend of emotional feelings. And then another point may need a strong one, but you've got to learn to measure that, okay? Not too much for something minor. You don't want to shoot a cannon at a rabbit. Right? It's effective, but you've got no more rabbit. <laughs> so learn to measure your emotions. Now, here's something important. Where does emotion come from? Where do our feelings come from? Here's where they come from. The emotions that can really help in all of your future conversations, communication. It's the blend of all of your experiences and how they have affected you. The blend of all of your experiences and how they have affected you. That creates now your emotional content, creates your emotional vitality and worth. So that's part of the getting ready experience on the emotional side. Be aware of your feelings. Be aware of your emotions. And as that experience grows, now when you get ready to talk, you've got the blend of knowledge and the blend of feelings to put into your conversation. And that's what creates the power. Now I have one more point and we'll take our break. It says, don't forget to say it. Part of communication is simply being aware that more often than not, things need to be said. It's pretty easy to take for granted, especially the people that are close around us, that they already know how we feel. But you've got to keep expressing how you feel. Here's a good phrase. Actions are no substitute for words. Now, we've used the other phrase, right? That words are no substitute for action. And that's true. Just talk, 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 and not acting. See, that's not good. But here's what else is not good. All of the action and no talk. Make sure that the words accompany the action. Don't fail to say it. Probably one of the greatest difficulties in married life is this breakdown in communication, not clearing the air often enough, not keeping this 
open dialogue going constantly. One thing I found out, take nothing for granted. Say, well, surely they understand. Well, just explain it one more time. Just say it one more time. Don't take a chance that whether they know it or not, bring up the subject again. Make sure it's clear. It's too easy to let it slide and not make it clear. Especially the people around you. Say, so how often do you have to tell the people that you love, that you love them? How often? Answer, often. Often. We all need reassurance. We all need the, it to be clear and pointed so that we know there are some things you just don't let go. And there are some actions that will only say certain things they won't say at all. You can give somebody flowers, but flowers won't do all the talking. Flowers say, you remembered. That's, about, that's probably what flowers say. But flowers don't say, you do incredible things to me. Nobody affects me like you do. Now, see, flowers will talk, but they won't say that. That's the card you've got to put along with the flowers. Let the flowers say whatever they can say, but then don't fail to put the other words with it because the words are so important. Judy gave me this watch back when I had a birthday in 1972, I believe it was. And it was a neat watch, Le Cool Tray. If all goes wrong, I can catch the watch in and live for a while, right? Then <laughs> Judy was always doing things like that. Fabulous watch, neat, neat gift for my birthday. But see, better than the watch was what she wrote on the back. I appreciated the watch, but the words were better than the watch. On the back, she had inscribed, my love for all time. Your Judy, September 1972. See, the watch was neat, but the words. She could have put the words on a Mickey Mouse watch. <laughs> Pardon me, Walt. I didn't mean to downgrade your mouse. But... but see, the words were what was really important. So I'm saying... Let actions speak, but make sure the actions don't substitute for the words. Make sure you say it. And if you'll make sure you'll say it, you'll get better at it. You'll get the practice. You'll learn to put more feelings in it. You'll learn to say it well, say it better. And this whole process of communication for you, if you don't treat any of it casually, will start to grow. And you will be even startled in the next few weeks, the next few months, at what happens as a result of your future conversations if you become more aware of these things that we have just talked about. Sensitivity, fascination, interest, working knowledge, having something good to say, saying it well, reading the effect you're having, and the intensity of strong feelings.